And then um, I'm going to hand over to Ira. So Ira is a lecturer at um, the University of Tenderawasi in um, West Papua. She's also, um, I'm going to jump the gun um, on one of my interview questions and describe you as an activist for human rights as well. Ira um, is a lecturer in human rights and peace and conflict studies, um, what, lectures into those topics under the umbrella of international relations and is doing some exciting research on indigenous identity and resource management. So I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask you about that. But the format today is I'll just start by asking some general questions and Ira, it's up to you where you wanna kind of take those when you finish speaking, <coughs> throw out the next question. And then we'll open the floor or I don't know what you call it in Zoom, the, the room, we'll open the room up to um, questions from there. So thank you, Ira. Um, could you? start by telling us about yourself, where you're from, um, where you grew up and what it was like growing up in West Papua. Thank you. Thank you, Kami. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited and grateful to be invited here. This is my very first time. And um, thank you for being me uh, spaces to also share. And I thought the first time when I was invited, I thought this was going to be very formal, like a webinar discussion. But I mean, it's very, I'm, I'm very relieved that it's going to be a very uh, <laughs> cozy conversation among all of us. So um, I'm an indigenous uh, West Papuan. So my parents come from, B came from my father from Biak and my mother from Serui. And I was born here in uh, Jayapura, the capital city of Papua province. Um, I grew up actually, I, I think I'm quite I'm quite like lucky because I grew up in several places. I moved around because of my father's job. So I once I, I stayed in Merauke, which is the southern part of uh, Papua for like nine years. And afterwards I moved to Manokwari, the capital city of Papua province and living there for like three years. And then I also lived in uh, Fak Fak. Uh, for three years and then went back to Jayapura. So I pretty much like going around, uh, went around uh, Papua province. And I think because of that, um, because I move around a lot uh, during my childhood, I feel like uh, I understand one thing about Papua that there is no single identity of Papua. I mean, people always think Papua is just like Papua. Papua is one single identity. But like for instance, when I went to uh, when I live in Merauke, now the population would be like I don't know sixty percent non Indigenous Papua and forty percent Indigenous Papua. When I was there, like 10, 25 years ago. I I remember uh, I met a lot of migrants, uh, it, mostly Japanese people. I interacted with them very much. When I live in Fak Fak, I remember like in the small class, 30 students, only two person, two students were Christian. So people always think that uh, majority of Papua is Christian, majority are Christian. But when we went to other small places like in Fak Fak, uh, we can see that Papua actually is very diverse. So because of that, I think, uh, I think uh, my experiences with Papua, that the first one, uh, it really helped me to enhance my, um, view about Papua that we cannot say Papua is one single identity, Papua is Papua. And I think it's very misleading. It, it has been translated to many policies in development policies. That's how the government see us that just one Papua, that's it, Papua. First off, we don't really talk about there is a diverse identity in Papua. Uh, but also it's uh, also, I think uh, I can see, I will say that I'm kind of like, a am a Privilege Papuan. I would say that if I want to compare myself with other uh, indigenous Papuan here, in terms of access to education, I mean I'm I'm so grateful because my maybe because of my parents, two of them they they work in public sectors and they managed to like put me in the college, I get higher education, and I'm 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 privileged compared to other indigenous Papuan to enjoy these uh, academic benefits. So uh, I think that that's how I live, and that's how it changed my life. Changed my life. I mean, to like uh, move around Papua, it really enhanced my perspective to see Papua, not to see them as single identity, but their multi-layer identities, their multi-layer of problems, and like I'm one person who really against uh, uh, the the thought about how we are always 
dichotomize, like put in the oppositional dichotomies because we are so diverse. Uh, that's maybe that's how I, I'm going to start about my introduction. Terima kasih, Ira. Um, so since you grew up um, moving so much, maybe that's why you decided you were interested in different cultures and people from different places. And you thought maybe I'll look at the international um, relations um, now that you've looked at different Papua nations. Is that how did you how did you come to be an academic at Unchen and what what kind of motivated you on the academic pathway and why do you want to why, you know, what was your pathway to teaching international relations? So, so I, I actually, when I was like uh, graduated from senior high school, I really wanted to be an ambassador, whatever countries. Like I really wanted to be an ambassador because I really want to fly from one state to another state. That really, that's my humble dream when I was still like very, really young. Uh, but then, um, I am so lucky and I, I went to Gajabada University in Yogyakarta to do my bachelor degree in, in international relation. And that's how uh, that simple thought of me, I want to fly to other states. So I feel international relation will be my ticket to the world. Uh, but when after afterwards, after I learned about international relations and meet some important persons in the college, uh, I remember I'm going to mention his name, uh, the late Samsu Rizal Pangabean. So he's one, he was one of my lecturers who really concentrated on, has expertise on the conflict resolution. And he always, he used to discuss with me about the conflict resolution in Aceh. I was so interesting and I always ask myself, like my student now, like keep asking ourselves about what is wrong with Papua, why it took so many years to like, uh, to finish, uh, why there is no peace agreement until now, why Aceh could have their own special autonomy with a very greater autonomy, not like Papua, they have MOU Helsinki, why, 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 what about us? I always ask my question about the security session, why they sent more military, uh, and that, that question really bugging me. And when I met some important person in my life and the college, and I realized that uh, I think it's important to just focus myself on peace and conflict resolution, because I think it's relatable, very relatable to, to the place that I live now in Papua. Uh, so I think uh, when I was in uh, Gajabara University in Yogyakarta, that's how I have this awareness about what is happening. When I flew from Papua to uh, Gajabara University, I can say I have only very limited awareness about what is happening in Papua, like other people here in Papua. Like we know there's conflict, but that's it. We do, we do not really think seriously about that, but after, I have, uh, when I went, uh, I understand about the conflict resolution in Aceh. I understand about uh, the conflict resolution in several places in the world. And I kept, it kept back bugging me about why, why we cannot like achieve this resolution, whatever the result, whether we were talking about the referendum or special autonomy or whatever, why, why don't we put more option on the table and really talk about it? So that's my question, keep begging me. That's how I decided to uh, really understand about peace and conflict resolution. But also I think maybe one of uh, another experiences also because of my encounter with the uh, Australian West Papua Australian community when I uh, did my master's in ANU, I think it's really, uh, I think I feel like uh, my awareness as a, as a oppressed, as an who come from oppressed identity become really get, became getting stronger when I encountered with Kakaroni and my now my husband and other uh, people in, in Canberra and to see black like, brothers, for instance, so many questions keep bugging me. And I think I really need to ask and criticize everything in Papua. Like we cannot normalize things in Papua. It's not normal here. So, so I think that's how I feel like uh, it's very important to really uh, choose my academic pathway in uh, conflict and resolution and peace studies. And Kemi, I think uh, even though we're talking about conflict resolution, it's more important to talk more about peace. That's how we, I think it's very important to really think about how, how do we gonna achieve this peace, yeah. Yeah, um, and, and how long have you been working at Unchen? 
as a since, academic? Um, it's actually since 2009. Okay. Since 2009. Yeah. Can I ask, are there many other people teaching the same things that you're teaching and working on similar issues? Many other academics, Papuan? Uh, yeah. Uh, in our universities, there there were there are three, two or three of us oh, okay. who focus on uh, peace and conflict resolution. Okay. Not too much. <laughs> Not too oh, many. Well, uh, people. that that sounds pretty good compared to most universities, probably. So, um, thank you, um, Sister Ira. Okay, so. You have been working recently in Biak um, uh, on resource management, and you said you've also been working in Bovendigal. Um, mm. And I'm wondering if you can tell us about your current project um, on, on Indigenous resource management. Yeah, so um, um, now we're uh, doing uh, research on what is actually, we try to document what is actually the fair and sustainable uh, natural resource management in the coastal and forest uh, areas in several places. So we choose uh, Bovendigul and uh, Kabupaten Jayapura, Jayapura Regency, and uh, Supiori in Biak. So what we gonna, what we wanted to do is actually want to fill it the gap because the government of Indonesia has now they have a very uh, dominant narrative about the infrastructure development stuff about they conceptualize the 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 development in the context of indigenous nine uh, region nine indigenous region uh, indigenous. Uh, perspective, but they do not have like really clear concept what is actually indigenous, uh, indigenous uh, based approach that they want to implement in Papua. So we're trying to like put up, fill up the gap about, we want to bring the small case, micro uh, case about, this is what we think the, the development that really suitable to the uh, indigenous people. But when we went there, I think we couldn't, we could not really get the answer. So when we went to, for instance, like Bovendigul, so Bovendigul is a newly uh, established region. Um, but but when we went there, we went to one small uh, village named Iowa. This is just a very small village with like 300, uh, four, 300 people inside the village, but there are three, uh, three corporation uh, like really uh, just behind uh, on, on their lanes. And uh, they have a very, a lot of problems that we found out. We, we, we come up with a very ideal, uh, ideal purpose to document what is the ideal development. But when we came there, what we found is very worsening situation. We can, we could find how the, 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 the people who live in Bovendigo, they're really heavily dependent on this big, uh, big river called uh, Digul, Digul River, but now it has been very uh, dirty. It has been um, polluted because of the corporation, and it really changes. It really changed their life. Now they have very limited option to for their livelihood, and we also find out that like uh, we we have like fifty respondent, female respondent, and. 90% of the respondents, they experience uh, maternal, not maternal, but uh, their kids pass away, like two or three of their kids have passed away because of malnutrition, because of couldn't access to the, uh, couldn't access to the health center, uh, centers. Uh, so it's like, it's a very disturbing fact that we found that uh, from 90% of our respondents, women, female respondents have experienced these situations. So, um, so yeah, so it, it's a very worsening, but also one of the highlight, it's about uh, how we can see the relation between uh, the people in Bovendigo with a corporation and also the relation between them with the government. We can see that they feel uh, corporation can, that they can, uh, they always, I, I feel like uh, somehow, um, they do not really, they, do, they cannot feel the presence of state or government in, in, oh. in both and for instance, because the government to reach the government is very far away from their, their, their uh, place. And another highlight that we can see the road Papua, the trans Papua 
road construction. Government always said that is to promote connectivity and stuff. But when we went there, like uh, we can really see how uh, discriminatory that road is. We can really see that how this road is just built for uh, to link one corporation to another corporation to bring their delivery the, the, to deliver their goods and their stuffs. And while the the indigenous Papuan they will be living like ten. 12 kilometers away, far away from uh, the main road. So I think we don't really need like very sophisticated, uh, sophisticated research to, to see that this, this, this is a very discriminatory project that have been built by the government. And we can, I think it's important for us to like really prove that Trans Papua Road is not for indigenous Papua, it's just for to, to, to serve the, the 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 capitalist the oligarchy so that that's that's just uh, several highlights that uh, mm. I think some um, bugging very very disturbing facts that we found in uh, uh, in Bovendigo. That's um, really interesting. At the same time as being not too surprising, like you say, um, and I'm wondering um, if. Um, like what, what research methods are you using? Are you interviewing um, people, just the women or the men as well? So we are, uh, we interview both of them. Okay. We interview both women and uh, men, but also we're now doing some survey on, uh, in Bahasa they call survey rumah tangga perikanan. So we also do some survey uh, to find out the, the, their incomes and uh, how do they, they their livelihood and uh, also to to assess about the terminology, what's the terminology, kemiskin and poverty, uh, indicators of poverty, uh, according to this research, at the this survey instrument. Hmm. Well, what is the corporation that's in Bovendigo, or the three? Three, uh, so it's a BCA, Berkah Cipta Badi, it's a this is uh, what they call uh, anak perusahaan. This is the branch from Corindo Group. Corindo, the largest one. The palm oil? Corindo, yeah, the palm oil. And the second one is uh, BI, uh, BI, I forget the name. And the third one is uh, MRJ, Merauke Rayon Jaya. Uh, so there are three corporations uh, that, you know, uh, around, around the, the, around them, around the indigenous peoples. Are they all in the palm oil business or different? Yes, all of them in palm oil business. Okay. All right. That'll be really interesting to see um, when your research comes out and is published. Um, and maybe some, maybe we could do, you know, publish with the West Papua project or something we can see. But um, thanks. Thanks so much, Ira. It's really interesting. Um, now, I wonder if you call yourself an academic as well as an, I'm oh, sorry, an activist as well as an academic. Um, how, you know, do you try and make a difference to social justice in your job? And do you do that outside of your job as well? I will call myself a uh, active uh, act scholar, scholar activist, perhaps. Yeah. So if we, because here in Papua, like they all, some, my, some of my colleagues always said that, Ira, please stop being activist. Or like every time I talk, every time I talk, like, no, I, why they always have to be allergic when we criticize the government? I'm, I don't understand about it. So, like for instance, now they're talking talk about pemekaran stuff uh, uh, and pemekaran and like because I in some webinars I don't agree with that and some of my friends think that it's the time for me to just stop criticizing the government and take the position of being a pure academics. I don't I don't even really understand what is pure academic means for my my friends because I think objective. How people, yeah objective that's what they always said to be an objective academics whether it means do not criticize the government uh because I remember uh, I don't know I think I'm just I just want to share this so in one uh, in my university I remember there with my senior and very respectable scholar here and we were discussing about the the research name is about the road roadmap to the development in Papua, and one of the anthropologists actually talk about uh, how the development have become very top down, paternalistic. Put the put all of the facts that 
it have uh, caused detrimental effect on indigenous people's life. But one of the professors, very respectable professor, uh, criticized this anthropologist uh, and said that you have to understand your position as an academic and we have to think about our institution and stuff. So that's how I, that's, uh, it, it really, it's, I feel very surprised in that uh, very, very small, uh, com our community, very small community, but those people, they are very important because they always contribute to the many academic, uh, many, many, many things about Papua, their, uh, their opinion always being used by the government for our life here in Papua, but why they, why they think like that? Why they always separated between scholar, between activists and academic? I, I don't even understand what where where should we put the boundaries because for me like being academics while I'm also female uh, indigenous female scholar activist I want to put myself as both of them uh, and I will use my my expertise like to rationalize what's happening in Papua I'm gonna use it to like put the name to all of things that are happening now. I want to use my expertise to explain what is happening, to predict what will be happening because of certain policies. And I want to use my uh, expertise to deconstruct everything that has been constructed by, by the government. I think so many things need to be deconstructed. I, I hope that with my expertise also, I want to tell my student to not normalize things here because they think we are living in a very normal situation, which is totally not. So yeah, so I will call myself scholar activist. <laughs> I want to join your club then. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so as um, as a scholar activist, I've seen you um, <clears throat> your image and your name on different flyers for webinars around Papua and Lives Matters and um, women's issues. I've seen, let's say, I've seen you around the internet um, and that you've been given guests lectures and that kind of thing so I'm wondering you know over the past few years what are some of the kind of activist issues that you've been working on maybe not necessarily doing research on but raising awareness around uh, I think one of the I feel very new is about the couple of matter about the racism uh, I, I put my uh, article in Jakarta post and about how I try really hard to try to correlate Papua lives better and tech lives better. Uh, for me, I think it's important to discuss about the racism because the first thing uh, I know very respectable scholar like Benny, Reverend Benny Guy, who always write down things about racism, but then it never become a, 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 a really a theme in the public to talk about the racism. It become our uh, our 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 topic in, in inside us. But after Papua Lives Matter, I think we put the racism in the table. We really openly talk about it. We with the Papua Lives Matter, we really understand that now there is racism because most of the uh, students, especially like uh, according like to my experiences when I was in Yogyakarta, I mean, most of the uh, West Papua students, they, they know they experience racism, but they did not have the name previously. Like, I know that it is not fair that I, I was be treated like that in the classroom, but I didn't, not, I didn't have the name for that. I didn't know that it's racism. But when it came to like the populist matter become a very big issue, I think now Papua students, they realize that, yeah, I, this is racism. What we, what we feel, we now have the name. The name is racism. Even like after, the, after my article, I remember I accept a message from my friend and she said, I'm, I'm so sorry if like in like 10 years ago, I said something that really hurt you. And now I understand that what you feel actually is racism. And, and I feel it's very important. Uh, I, I think I feel like now, at least now we know we have name uh, to the experience that we feel. It opened discussion to everything else. Did you feel like Black Lives Matter was very helpful in like helping, you know, helpful in bringing that category of racism out in West Papua? Like, was it was it useful having this kind of global movement around racism to to plug into, to touch into, tap into? Um, yes. Okay. Of course, because before, even when I remember when Obama became the president, like Papuan people here, they felt like they're so proud 
because of Obama, like black men, we did not have like any connection, but they feel very blessed that Obama became the president. So I feel like there is a, that kind of sense of blackness that bring us connected, but the Black Lives Matter has highlighted, highlighted the racism. I think it's, it's how we connected. Mm. We, need, we need international, I think Papua in, 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 in this, uh, we, we are so rep repressed and oppressed. We need international moment that really can connect uh, to what is happening. And so Black Lives Matter is important to, to be connected and to highlight what is happening inside. Mm. I remember I was in West Papua when Obama was elected as well. And I remember that um, the feeling and the, yes. the hope yes, that, that, exactly. yeah, um, that that brought about. Um, and can you tell us, um, do, do you work on women's, um, women's rights, women's issues as well? Or is that not something, you know, as a, as a female scholar and activist, is that something you're involved in? Yeah, yeah. Um, this research as well, we use uh, the women's indigenous women's perspective by, uh, as a, as one of the, our tools to to analyze. But also, um, we I, I, I use my uh, university platform. Usually, uh, do several series of webinars on the uh, gender based violence as well to my students. Mm. Uh, I think it's very important to raise awareness as well about that. So we use that platform. But on the other hand, I, I used to work, work with Dewan Adat Papua as well. Uh, we, we did some research about Pasar, about the market and the position of women in, in the market. The Mama Mama. Mama Mama di Pasar in Manokwari. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, what did that research tell you? The, so maybe if people aren't familiar with the Mama Mama di Pasar movement, the, the women who work in the markets, what was the issue there that you were looking at? What? The, yeah, so uh, so back to like uh, when, when Jokowi, President Jokowi uh, first was first elected and uh, he built uh, the market for Mama Mama for the for our uh, Mama Mama here in Jaipura, and it's one of the one one of the the very important infrastructure development that he did to to us. And but then uh, we try to see why why it did not really have uh, did not really men or did not really help Mama Mama to or you know fix their life why why there is no changes and until now like this market actually so not so many people go there they built it like three floors big one the big market but uh mama mama they only use the first floor they yeah. do not use like, the second the third floor so we're questioning about why they have to like spend so many so much money and they said that this is one of the success of the, of the, the government and when we did the research and Man, in Manokwari, we found out that uh, we criticize firstly we give the input firstly about the structure of the market itself that uh, it has to be very anthropological it has to base on the uh, the custom of the people but also we found out that about the how uh, how not all of the mama mama have to have don't think that it's ideal for my mama to go to Pasar and stay there. And we think that's the ideal economic situation for them. We want to challenge the government to do not think about the market. We have to give other option because development has to provide more option to people. And we don't think Pasar Pasar is ideal because when mama mama, they go to, to the market and they compete with other migrant, yeah. migrant they will they will be easily being beaten. They could not really compete with them and they could not like improve their economic life because of that. So we, we need to find other system uh, more of like more not uh, more fair market for them or just don't put them in the uh, market if that's not the best for them. We have to give them other option of life. That, that's how a uh, uh, recommendation to the government after the, the assessment in Manokwari. Right, okay. Um, and so you've touched on a few of them, but can you kind of maybe um, outline some of the, the biggest social justice or human rights issues in West Papua today? 
what are the what are the biggest issues facing West Papuans? You're talking about, you know, that we need to address this problem of peace and conflict. Um, mm. Why is the government unwilling to um, kind of open some kind of dialogue with Papuans about it? I guess that you've said that's a major issue. What else? Um, and, you know, corporations and development not being the answer. But, um, yeah, is there anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, in, in in several webinars, I always talk about uh, uh, the opposite, what they call, uh, how, how the government always put everyone in the two boxes, like the first, the boxes of uh, pro-independence, or they call merdeka, and then after, uh, the second box is um, is NKRI harga mati. Uh, that's how the government always put everyone only in two boxes, like there is no other room for democratic, for humanitarian issues. Uh, so I think it's not about the political position that I want to talk, but I want to talk how uh, how it is. It's very it's very. Uh, I think it's very dangerous because when the government put us like when one when we want to talk about the situation of refugees, internally displaced peoples, for for instance, uh, many of academics because I'm from academic community, they do not really want to take position to like really see this is a problem or some of the people they do not really want to feel empathy with the with the uh, internally displaced people because they see when when they put the position and say they become emotional with them, it means that they they are they support the pro independence group and and that is happening in other other things as well for instance in discussion of pomakaran just yesterday i remember one of the uh, people high level officer from the ministry said that those who against the pomakaran policy actually supporter of independence and this is uh, become our conversation why we always put people to this this these two boxes without seeing that when we criticize the government the, uh, the government uh, the government it means I mean it's important for us to criticize like other citizens and we have right to criticize and that is normal in democratic country why can't we criticize this Pumakaran why why they have to put the label on us who criticized the Pomakaran. So I think that is one Sister of the Ira, problems. Sorry, can you explain the Pomakaran issue? Because oh, yeah. this might be for people who don't know about the division. Yeah, so so just uh, 30, 30 on 30 June, the government, they already legalized uh, the law that then now we have a new three provinces in Papua. Uh, but it has become a problem because uh, people, most people in Papua, they said no to uh, this division into three provinces because they know that when they have become divided to three provinces, it means no military comments. It means uh, they know that even they know that this division based on the how they want to exploit all the resources because we know that in several context, several uh, several provinces, there are gold, there are uh, many na natural resources, and upon people here, they know that the government just just you know is is nonsense to say that this from this from a car or this this deficient to improve the welfare of the indigenous people because that's what they always said. So when this discussion. Uh, well, before 30 June, the government uh, the government said that they want to uh, have this three division of the provinces. Many people here they went to the street and they said no, and even some people pass away because they have to like uh, you know have in incident with the um, uh, Indonesian police. Uh, but but the government they did not want to accommodate all of these voices, and they said that you reject our uh, our program it means that you're anti-government it means that you support you support uh, the independence so yeah so i think it doesn't make any sense we i mean we're citizens and it is normal to say no or to say yes it's what is important is to, pro to provide mechanism to provide spaces to those who against it to listen to them but the central government did not do that on 30 September. They just said, okay, it has been legalized and it means now we have five provinces in this Tana, Papua. So that's the story. So I think that is very, uh, because of this construction, 
Papua uh, Merdeka versus NKRI Harga Mati, they try to like disregarded all of all of the criticism towards government on the name of those who support their independence. They always like, I think it's very dangerous to put people uh, on the two boxes but, and re re disregarded the democracy, the human rights, the humanitarian issues that also is important but never been addressed. That, I think that is one of the one of the problem that I can see about this uh, dichotomies that have been have been built like forever in, in, in Indonesia about Papua. Mm. Well, what can we do um, here in, in Australia? I mean, you have a bit of an idea of what, what resources we have, what our government is in general, what it's like when you spent time here in Canberra. Um, yeah, what, what do you, you know, do you have any suggestions for what, what we can do to support um, human rights in West Papua and to support indigenous West Papuans? Yeah, uh, for, for me, like uh, as, as an academic, I think for an academic community, I think it's important to uh, our, our, all of our uh, role, I think is to expose this oppressive system. I think it's very important to uh, using our resources, like for academics, uh, more research, collaborative research, uh, on on very urgent issue like development issues, human rights issues, situation of uh, of livelihood, and also but assessing and evaluating the securitization policy that have been conducted like forever in Papua and just to podize them with the situation of people here. I think it's important to put them together and 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 it has to it, it will it will be strong if it, we have a collaborative. Uh, assessment on it and then think about how we can strategically uh, has strategically pushed them to influence the advocacy the of policy uh, because as I mentioned before now the government always use the securitization issues uh, to 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 everything uh, in Papua and it disregarded uh, other important problems like humanitarian problems and livelihood situation of uh, indigenous people. And also I think some other issue like racism, I think it's important to like have more academic, uh, we need to expose this racism uh, because, because uh, after my uh, article in Jakarta Post, I remember one week after uh, two of uh, high official in government, uh, they released an uh, article in Kompas and also in uh, Jakarta Post stated that, that there is no racism in, in, in Indonesia towards Papua because now Papua have enjoyed special autonomy. I think it's, it, it hurts us in Papua to read that one. How you said special autonomy is a good medicine for us to finish the problem of systemic racism. I think it's important to really expose this racism, not only the concept of racism, but how they manifest in a judicial system, how they manifest in every system in our life now in Papua. I, I think it's one of the, I think, urgent, very urgent to, to see that. And also, I think more also about the situation of um, the corporation and how it it really, it really like, uh, it really, uh, I don't know, how do I say? Uh, the activists always said that the problem in Papua is about the destruction of uh, uh, destruction of uh, the war, the destruction of the life. But we need to be very, very, very comprehensive to see that when the corporation comes, it's not just about the water have become being like uh, uh, it's about the system of life of West Papua. We need to put the name whether ecocida if ecocide. When we want to use that term, I think we need to find the terminology to put to explain what is happening there in Papua because this, the the destroy is is systemic is everything and it really it influences our life. And about Australia, and also I think funding also is important if we have resources or find funding, especially to. Uh, strengthen the local community, the, the institution, NGOs. I think it's important because they do work on a very, on, on a basis on the community. Uh, I think it's important to also, you know, if we have funding, it's important also to fund uh, the movement 
uh, now the, the the movement that they do not have like a very legal status on the institution but but they really work so hard to protect like human rights defenders those who like go to the street i think i think it's, it's also important to really empower them uh with the with the necessary funding and also i think other thing is giving spaces to Papuan, I think it's very important to really put their narrative because I think now we are like in the war of narrative between us and the government. Mm -hmm. uh, the government always uh, boasts about the development, their infrastructure development, their economic development. It is important to really put others, others uh, to counter this narrative by putting more Papuans uh, to talk about it. But what is important, not just give space to talk, but what should we do We do after that? I think it's important. Just, it's important to put more Papuan talk on webinars, but it's more important, way important to think about what should we do afterwards? What is the, the practical things that we can do after after that? Yeah, I think that, that's what I, I can think about what I really can do. Very comprehensive. <laughs> Thank you, Ira. Um, well, I think that brings us to the end of the interview section and we have time for maybe one, maybe two questions. Um, so if any of you have anything that you really want to know um, from Ira, please go ahead and ask now. Any questions? Oh. Ah, okay. Viro. Can you hear me from here? Oh, Rex. Okay, Rex and Viro. Oh, Rex. So you can oh, hear me. Kaka, kaka Rex dulu dong. <laughs> Uh, Senior. Selamat semua. Vida, selamat. Ya, yeah, Om Rex, selamat. Uh, Wister Roni, Veronica, kami. Oh, everybody is here. Okay, I like to ask something very specific. Uh, biodiversity is one of the issues that I, I think uh, some of your fellows like uh, Max Binur are trying to follow up in Supiori. And I don't know whether you people work together or not. Dr. Mansoben is there. Every educated people from Supiori are doing nothing. I, I, maybe they don't understand, but I, I did not see anything. That's why I criticized them. Uh, but that's specific. Biodiversity is very important. Uh, Max Binul is trying to do something about it. Mm. <laughs> OK, Biod biodiversity. Yeah. yeah. Biodiversity. Well, um, like, can you be more specific? Biodiversity. So, how? Uh, so, yeah. Um, um, Rex, is your question is um, Sister Ira working with uh, Max Pinor? Is that yeah, your question? That's what I mean. Uh, uh, because uh, a lot of people try to do something by in themselves. I don't know whether you have any cooperation with everybody uh, else, like okay. Max Pinor and uh, uh, Finn Sauer doing clean water supply for the people in the fields. Oh, and also okay. Dr. Mansoben in anthropology. Mansoben. You educated people from Superior, but you don't cooperate to work together uh, on something. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Kaka Max Binor, uh, we'll, Kaka Max Binor, we put the, his name as one of our uh, Narasumber source person. So this is still ongoing research. We are now doing the analysis. Kaka must be Max Binner will be one. Uh, he's now based in in Biak, and we we do not come. We we are planning to. We already put his name on the list as one of the our source person, but we haven't contacted yet uh, on Rex. But that's the plan. I also work with uh, Kaka Max Binner, but uh, inside Papuan Voices, uh, the local community filmmaker. Uh, but that's the plan uh, about Bapa Man Mansoben. We we did not you work with Bapa Mansoben because I think he's now uh, he's quite limited to work uh, on the field uh, because I don't know uh, why perhaps because of the more of like uh, the health reason. But we use his uh, book and his uh, assessment. It's very important. That's that's the book that we always use about because I don't think there's uh, no other. A uh, comprehensive uh, assessment about the Papuans, uh, the the Papuans culture, uh, except from Bapa Mansoben. Mm -hmm. But in our team, uh, Omrex, we have uh, I don't know if Omrex know Nura Suryawan. 
So Ngura Suryawan is an anthropologist oh, from Nepal. Yeah, so Ngura Suryawan and I, uh, we are in the same uh, research team, okay. this team. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Amrex. Um, Veronica, your question? Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, so about um, Pasar Mama Mama, it's because uh, in the um, uh the 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 one the first formalized uh, pasar mama granted by the government after work of more than eight years if i'm working in mistaken eight years right Rojit by Rojit. the uh, the late Rojit and um and uh so finally when we uh, because the, the the initial thought was like um um uh, papuan mama mama uh, just sitting on the floor under the rain under the the sun and like just just the the like uh, the sitting on the floor uh what am i trying to say <laughs> uh, it's like it's not proper it's not appropriate for the mama mama to be in that situation but so the uh, the, the building uh uh was finally uh, given but then after short while Mama Mama just started to uh, sit on the floor anyway. And then uh, also that's the case uh, in in other uh, part. Uh, is it Nabire or... Uh, and then I heard from someone who's been to PNG. I've never been to PNG. Um, they said that um, the, uh, the, the, the women in PNG, they also like to sell uh, basically, actually, that somehow become the uh, uh, the uh, the. It's maybe it's Melanesian way. It's it's like how they like it to be. So so I'm I'm not sure. Uh, what do you think about that? Why why um uh, so you mentioned earlier that it's uh, due to the anthropological. The building is not. Uh, based on an anthropological, you know. Appropriate design. Yeah. So, so is it is that why, or 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 is there any other reason it's been bugging me? Do you mind elaborating about it? They feel more comfortable sitting on the ground. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know because because that could be just a stereotype. So I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, we also we that, that's one of what Bob, 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 Omrek said is right. Uh, uh, so. Uh, they do not. They do not sit comfortably on the second, third floor. Even uh, when they sit, uh, they they want to sit like on the floor. So that's what we found in Manokwari and also in Jayapura. In several market, we found that they do not really like. Even when they put like uh, higher, like seat, higher seat, they do not want to sit there. They just want to sit on the floor. And when we asked them, they said because because i like it i want to sit like this like no explanation like you ask we we we, we wanted to have like more sophisticated more really whatever uh explanation but he said i'm comfortable sit like this that that is one of the reason why we criticize very that market and i think uh when i asked the the design the designer of the market here in in jayapura three floor i think they they uh, bring the concept of pasar bring hardo in yogyakarta like one two three floors they think it will be good like mama mama will be selling on the second the first floor and the second floor those who will sell uh clothes and the third floor they so that they said that concept they try to put here in 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 papua and it's it's definitely not the papuan style uh, as well. so based on that research do you find any um uh, uh recommendation coming based on that research what uh, what kind of marker would be best for mama mama because the old markets are shitty anyway it's not proper uh, so what is the ideal uh, pasar then? Yeah, so uh, based on this mano, uh, specific case on, on Manokwari, mm -hmm. uh, this is quite interesting from Manokwari. We asked them, we said, do you want to have this exclusive market like only Mama Mama who sell them? They said, no, we didn't want that. They said, because 
uh, I think it will be counter. Uh, it's different to pasar mama mama here. But in Manokwari, mama mama said they prefer to have mix uh, market with mix uh, other from migrant to sell them. Yeah. yeah, more diverse uh, because they said that. Uh, when they try to when so be, beforehand they have this very exclusive market they try to sell but they say people like to go to other to non-indigenous uh, seller they went there and they said we don't know why we already put our tomatoes for instance we put this very nice to attract more buyers to come but we don't know why they want to go to buy to that migrant uh, traders there. So so we try to understand that, and, and we said, what about we put like all the mama mama in the in the front part of the market, and then we put the migrant like on the other like we put in the same building, but we're gonna prioritize uh, mama mama to put them in, in in front of the market. We do not come until like, what is the grand design? What is the ideal design? Because we think we need more, more, more research to see the models because it's a model. I think it's more research to, to, to find, but, but we find out they do not want to be, to have exclusive market like, yeah. Uh, only, only for mama. They, they do not think it's it will be good for their for their income. That is what we found from uh from from that from the the Manokwari case. One last follow up question. Um, uh, Cami. <laughs> yeah, let me just see. Is there anyone else that wants to ask a question? Okay, it's all yours, Veronica. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh. So is there any policy work uh, going on towards, uh, I heard for a while that um, to make to make certain policy that uh, migrants should not be selling the same products that indigenous mamas are selling. Is that a current work or ongoing work or no? Yeah, well, that's a good question, Tara, because like uh, when we did this uh, in like, we did this research like three, four, Four years ago, I remember for the government, they're trying to push the legislation, uh, perda to protect the uh, the 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 commodities, uh, because that is one of the complaint of my mama as well. Because now, like migrants sell everything, they sell yeah. the traditional clothes, they sell pinang, betel betel nut, they sell everything that usually mama mama, uh, who are the ones who sell them. But as I know, there is no uh, policy on that. Even in the airport, it's getting worse now. We we have to buy battle net from the Bugis uh, traders. They, they 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 sell everything. Even now they wanted to sell ikan asar, it's like grill grill fish as well. Usually that's uh, people from Serui and Biak usually sell that. But now they wanted to uh, now more of migrant traders who sell this uh, very specific. Uh, commodities that usually become uh, the main commodities of the Papuan indigenous uh, mm. seller. So as I know, maybe maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but as I know, there is no, uh, until now, there's no leg legislation on that based on my observation here, like more migrants sell betel net, even Oked now, and Ikan, and Ikan Asar as well. Mm. Okay, I think on that note, um, we'll finish up. I just want to finish by thanking you um, profusely, Sister Ira, for um, educating us about what it's like to be an academic working on um, important and controversial issues in West Papua. Thank you for telling us what, you know, what we need to be kind of focusing on um, as um, people who want to support human rights in West Papua. And um, yeah, for giving us a, um, some points of what we can do. And thank you for your time and your generosity and your perspectives. Um, and this will, this recording and a transcript will go up on the West Papua Project web page at um, the University of Wollongong's um, website in the next, probably within two weeks. So okay. banyak and goodbye to everybody. And thanks to everybody else who came along today. Bye. There are other participants, but we can't see them because they don't oh. have the video on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you to everyone else who came along as well. Yeah.